in the last 15 years, there's been a lot of flat tap at cam failures. And recently, there's been a lot of videos on YouTube talking about the reasons why. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about that and what's actually happening with these. So let's talk about today. It's going to get spicy. That's taken me about 10 months to collect all these different samples of lifters and a couple of different camshafts here to show you some of the things that fail and the reasons why. But what I also wanted to do was get a lot of different lifters from different manufacturers. So when you look at these, tell me which ones on here are the ones made by Howard's. Tell me the ones that are made by Clay Smith or Comp, Crower, Iski, the cheap uh, knockoff Summit brand. You can't, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well, of where these lifters are sourced, where the cam cores are sourced, and where a lot of these companies are getting these materials, because one of the common misconceptions has been, well, now all the camshaft cores are coming from China, all lifters come from China, that's the reason why they're failing. And quite honestly, there's probably a little bit of that in the marketplace, depending on what flavor you're buying, uh, but there's quite a bit of the stuff that is still made in the U.S., and that's been the difficult side of it is seeing these U.S. made pieces getting just abused uh, with all of the things that are happening. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But I can tell you that everything that you see here on my benchtop is 100% made in the U.S., but we're going to talk about each individual piece, and we're going to talk about why camshafts fail, and we're going to talk about why the lifters fail. So we'll get started on that right now. Now, I've seen a really ton of bad videos out here on YouTube. About a year ago, there was a gentleman that said the reason why these lifters are failing is because manufacturers were rebuilding a flat tap at lifter. It couldn't be further from the truth. They're a disposable piece. They're very cheap. They're very inexpensive to make, even though the mechanism on the inside is very complicated and there's a lot of science that goes into these. But rebuilding a flat tap at Lifter, really, come on. Uh, he since deleted that video, and I won't mention his name, but there's been a lot of stuff like that, a lot of conspiracy theories, a lot of guessing, and we're going to cover all that today for sure. But the real question here is, has the cam materials changed? Have the lifters changed? Like we mentioned a minute ago about everybody assuming it comes from offshore, I can tell you that all of these are sourced here from the U.S. because I know what brands each one of these were uh, and why they failed. At least we can make a good assumption of why they failed. Cam cores are primarily made by two sources, and both of those are in Michigan. And I will tell you that it's probably not the cam cores that are suffering the problems. I believe most of these issues can be come back to the lifter the quality of the lifter and the reason being is like the, it's like flat tap at cam cores those oe suppliers that make cam cores are primarily making billet material 5150 5160 for modern engines everything comes with the hydraulic roller if it's a push rod type motor uh, even some of the stuff that's not that's a that's a follower cam follower type engine like the coyote uh, they're all made with a billet material. So for them to go back and forth between a couple of different materials and going through a different casting process, different heat treating process, it's one of the reasons why cast cam cores are getting harder and harder to find. Everyone's been out of cores for the last couple of years since COVID hit, and that's primarily due to those manufacturers losing a lot of staff, but two prioritizing what they can, they're going to make. So I can tell you that these cam cores that you see in front of you here are both U.S. made. They were both made by those manufacturers up in Michigan. And again, you can point to it on probably some manufacturers. Anything that's an offshoot of something, um, anything that's a white box type of program through some of the major retailers is probably going to be uh, you could probably guess that those are could come from China, but I will tell you that it's easier for them to source that stuff from a from a U.S. supplier. But again, it's part of the reason of the problem. Now, same with lifters. Lifters are very inexpensive. These are not that much to make. I mean, what's a, a set of lifters cost? Hydraulic flat tap costs today. You know, they've run anywhere over the last several years from you know under a hundred bucks to now with inflation and everything, you know, hundred hundred thirty dollars. What's a set of hydraulic roller lifters go for? 
five, six, eight hundred dollars. So when those manufacturers are manufacturing something, they're going to want to make something that has the most volume and it's going to make them the most money. And roller lifters are making them a lot more money than making an old flat tappet style lifter. So it, it, it makes sense financially for them to not continue to make these. So that's why you've seen a slowdown. Companies like Delphi, who's made lifters for seems like a hundred years. I don't know how long they've been in business or how long they've been making lifters, but they were going to get out of the flat tap at market completely before COVID hit. I, I think they're still making them, but uh, there's another brand in the U S that uh, is a private manufacturer that makes almost all of these lifters for all of the companies we mentioned at the beginning of the video. They're all U S made, but Again, you have to go back to what the dollars and cents looks like. And because these are so cheap and so inexpensive, on the other side of that, what they're selling it for to Howard's or, or Crane or Comp or, or Luminati or Clay Smith or whoever is going to be a lot less than the money that they would bring in for a roller lifter. So it's part of it. I, I get it. We don't want to talk about it, but it's part of the equation but I, f I firmly believe that most of the problems can be tied back to the lifter. So we're going to talk about three different things today of why these fail and what you can do on your side to help protect that. But I've got a solution that is a new product uh, that's come out in the last uh, four months here. And I'm going to show you that at the end of the video so you can see how some of this stuff is going to be irrelevant at the end of it. So let's talk about it. Just if you're a regular normal uh, guy or girl that's already got a flat tap of cam, you're getting ready to fire it up and break it in. Let's talk about how you can save it. Well, let's talk about the break-in process first. And more specifically, I want us to talk about oil. And here's where we run into our first major problem. There was a video not too long out about a Canadian YouTuber. He's got a ton of subscribers. Seems like a pretty uh, good guy. He's built a lot of stuff, but had a big block that he put together and it failed. Well, it was pretty evident as I watched the video of the reasons why he was experiencing the failure that he got. Uh, and one of them was the oil. A popular thing is, I'll just use diesel oil. It's got a ton of zinc and it'll be fine. They used to have a lot of zinc in it. They don't any longer. The EPA changed that that API that uh, that they follow for the recipe, and they can't include as much zinc in it anymore. So it doesn't have enough zinc. But the other side of that is when you take an off-the-shelf oil of anything and say, okay, well, I'll just go grab uh, you know five, six quarts of whatever at, at my local auto parts store, and I'll add a zinc additive in there, and it'll be just fine for my everyday oil. There's two things that happen with that. Um, here in about 90 days also, I guess I'll tease that right now, uh, we'll be doing an interview with Lake Speed Jr. who started Driven Racing on one that was the primary engineer behind that product for a long time, now works for Total Seal. We're going to talk to Lake and we're going to talk specifically about those those things with oil and break-in procedures because Lake is a very, very smart guy, understands all of those things. So be on the lookout for that video. In the next 90 days or so, we'll drop that. But here's the problem with adding a zinc oil to a off-the-shelf oil. This is a oil that's made to be used in service. It's not a break-in oil. It's not designed for any of those things. What happens is because zinc is a certain type of material. I believe it's an acid and the detergent packages that are in a regular API oil or regular uh, engine oil is a base. They fight each other. The detergent sees the zinc as a negative and it tries to eliminate it. It wipes it off the cam as quick as possible. Those Pro or materials that make up a, a additive package for the detergent side of a regular engine oil will fight it. The other side of that, and what Lake is going to tell us here in a few months, uh, if you remember back, we did a, a, a interview with the folks at Driven Racing Oil, and one of the things that they explained to us was oil is blended in a certain order and at a certain temperature. So they may start with the base oil, and then they may add in one additive, and then add in another, and add in another. And the temperature may change because they have to be able to mix together. And if you don't add them at a certain 
uh, in a certain order and a certain temperature, they don't blend together. So when you take this oil and you dump in six quarts and you throw in your zinc additive and maybe a, you know you cycle it through with the uh, with the uh, um, with the oil pump um, and try to you know get it mixed up, it's not going to mix. It has to reach a certain temperature before it mixes, and even at that point, as that temperature rises, the de detergent in the oil is going to fight it. So never, ever, ever, I know it's popular, I know it's easy, I know everyone out there sells a zinc additive that you can add to the oil, but please don't use it. Don't use a detergent oil in it. Get a specific break-in oil. Y'all know that I'm a big fan of the Driven Racing Oil. Always have been. As long as they're going to be around, I will always use that product. Driven had the first break-in oil in the market. This is a low detergent, so it doesn't wipe away all those cleaning proper, all those uh, properties that zinc has. And helps protect that engine during break-in. Now, break-in is something that's also a very uncommon um, misconception or a common misconception anyway is that you know you on a flat tap an engine you break it in for 20 30 minutes change the oil put regular oil back into it or a high zinc oil back into it and you're good to go no on a new engine break in is a three to four hundred mile process because you got to break in the rings as well too again something else we'll talk about with lake so that that process there of using an actual break in oil will increase your chances of successful cam break-in tremendously. Now, the break-in oil has a lot of zinc in it. It's designed for that, for these types of engines. And that zinc is a is a polar molecule. It attaches to the iron surfaces, so it's going to attach itself to the iron surfaces on the cam, on the lifter, to help break it in and, and create that phosphate, uh, I believe is what it is. Uh, again, Lake is going to correct all my mistakes here, uh, but it's really good at creating a layer of film on there to help protect it. And again, when you have a detergent oil that you mix that in, it washes that all away. So it's a really, really important to, to, to run a specific already blended break-in oil. Don't, don't mix your own and certainly don't just run a regular high zinc oil because again, it's got a lot of detergent in it. You know, even a good break-in oil or a, a regular oil like this GP1 from Driven, uh, it's still a detergent oil, so it's still going to wipe away all that zinc, so uh, or at least enough of it anyway. So, but that's also the reason why those manufacturers will blend in zinc and moly, uh, other lubricants to kind of help offset what the detergent packages have in it, whether it's got a lot of calcium or stuff that's designed to wipe all that stuff away. So anyway, it's a it's a long conversation on the break-in oil. We have, have had that a little bit before in the past. Uh, if you want to go back and watch the Driven Racing Oil video, I'll link that above. Uh, but uh, that one with Lake coming up is going to be pretty incredible. But once you get it broken in on a good break-in oil, also run an oil that's already been mixed. Don't mix an off-the-shelf oil with a zinc additive get an oil that is already pre-mixed now luckily the driven gp1 is a little less expensive than say their hot rod oil or some of their xp oils that are more um uh, more race oriented or more specific to a, a type of application this gp one's a really nice one it's a pennsylvania grade crude i believe they're the only manufacturer on the market that uses that uh for the you old school guys that's the folks that uh came out of there or the product that came out of the uh kendall uh facility back in the 60s 50s 60s and 70s where you know those hot rodders insisted that that oil helped create horsepower and dyno testing has proven that here over the last couple of years but anyway oil is probably the biggest one it's probably the one of the biggest mistakes people make uh but it's certainly not the only one so uh let's go on to the second one now let's talk about the next part of this because this is where i've seen some confusing things or watched some very confusing videos uh of some people guessing of what the interaction between the lifter and the camshaft is so it's been talked about fairly frequently that there is a crown on the lifter i'm going to do a drawing here just a minute to kind of show this and a taper on the camshaft and what that is designed to do is to help rotate the lifter so what is the issue there well hydraulic flat tappet or flat solid flat tappet lifters have to rotate so they can survive it's how they keep uh, from you know sitting in one spot and wearing themselves down to put it very 
basically, I guess, anyway, but they have to rotate. When they don't rotate is when you get into issues that this one didn't rotate. Uh, it's pretty obvious this one didn't rotate. Uh, you can see where it kind of wore down through there. Those are indications that there was probably a bad interaction between the camshaft and the rotation of it uh, uh, spinning on, on the shaft. Um, there's a couple of other things in there too, um, but let me get it. Let me move this out of the way real quick. I'll do a quick drawing and show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so let's talk about the interaction between the lifter and the lobe because I think that's part of what the part of what the confusion is here. So I'm going to draw a very very crude uh, camshaft here, and uh, this will be the lobe, but. Again, when we talk about lobe, and I'm going to overemphasize this here, it's not this dramatic, but there's a taper on the lobe. It's not a, a flat surface that goes along there. It is tapered. The reason for that, again, is it facilitates that rotation of the lifter, and, and every flat tap it can manufacture grinds something in there. Now, one of the very confusing things I saw in a recent video is that there was up to 3 thou of taper in it. No, that's way too much taper. Um, you're looking at, uh, at anywhere from 1 to 1 and a half is generally what the OE spec, I know Comp grinds everything on that. I think Crane and Luinati, Crane used to, Luinati does. I think Howard's is down in that range as well too. You don't need a lot of it, but you just need enough of it to help facilitate. You don't want anything that drastic because then you are going to cause some premature wear in it. So one to one and a half is, is typically where you're at. Now let's talk about the lifter. The lifter is generally offset. So if you look down into a, a bore um, in a uh, in an engine or you look down into the valley and you see the lifters and where they're riding on the cam, they're generally offset on there. And the reason for that is because it's trying to take it full advantage of the taper, put the lifter in the right spot so it will rotate as it needs to to help the lifter survive. The OE's figured that out very early and Thankfully, until, like I say, you know, 10, 15 years ago when all these failures started occurring, uh, it worked out just fine. Now, again, in reference to the camshaft, didn't leave me enough room here, but I'll give you a kind of an indication that the lifter has what we call a crown on it. And that's what they mean by a crown. It's a raised surface. Now, this is a very, very important piece, these two right here, the taper and the crown, because they have to match. You can get away sometimes with maybe running a, a comp a cam with the taper they've got on it and maybe an off-the-shelf Elgin lifter, but you're you're really taking a shot in the dark here because they are designed to work together the taper on the cam and the crown on the lifter are designed to work together i'm going to show you some close-up pictures of this lifter right here this is a really really good example this is a comp lifter of what a good crown looks like now you're not going to see that by looking at this lifter from the side and go oh yeah it's got a massive crown on it i can see it you're not going to be able to measure it that easily you're going to have to kind of look for some indications. The first is the swirl pattern on the top. If it's got a good swirl that kind of is not regular, it kind of moves around a little bit um, the way this one is, that is an indication of a very, very good crown. You've got some, and I'll show you a picture here of what they call a pinhead, where they the cone comes almost up to a point uh, instead of it being a, a round uh, surface uh, or a, 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 a con, you know the, the surface there that is uh, pushes out like they're convex, it is comes more to a point and <laughs> those lifters don't do very well and it still technically has a crown on it but you can tell because right in the center you can see all the swirl swirl marks heading right towards it and again that picture shows a really good indication of what a really bad crown looks like so on a flat tappet engine always look for that that swirl pattern of being a little irregular but this is a really good example of it 
The second thing you need to look for on a lifter is that it's got a good chamfer on it. Now, this one has, again, it's got a very good chamfer. And the reason why they're chamfered like that is because it gives a lot of surface area for that lifter to ride onto the lobe. This one looks like it's got a, it's decent, um, but you can tell it's got a much wider chamfer than this one does here. And that's a big difference when you take even just that very minute surface area off, you're, you're leaving out the workable area of that lifter onto the lobe. There, I've seen some of these um, that are horrible in the chamfer. Um, and that is a real bad indication of, of a lifter that was not ground correctly or to a manufacturer's spec that I won't say they don't, don't know what they're doing, but it's a little confusing why they would put that much chamfer in it. This image here shows that, that chamfer of a really, really wide one. So it's just one thing to be aware of. Now, I will also tell you that, that if you buy a Howard's camshaft, buy the Howard's lifters that go with it. Don't mix and match. I understand supply issues are a huge concern right now. We've got tons of that problems across the country. Um, but don't mix and match lifters. They're designed to work together. Uh, if you're going to run a, a, a Howard's or an Isky or a Comp or whatever, Luonati, it doesn't matter. Match the lifter to their cam and go with their recommendation. Don't switch brands. Don't run a, a Comp and then go, well, I can't get the, the Comp lifters or a back order. I found a set on the internet somewhere off eBay. I'll just run those. They're flat tap and lifters. They're fine. They're not. Don't. <laughs> You're going to void your warranty for one, which could cause issues if you don't do this uh, break in properly. Uh, but also, too, with it, um, they're designed to work together. So don't cheat yourself out of there. Now, with the cam and lifters, let's also talk about the break in procedure as well, because this is also very, very important when you're talking about the RPM that you're operating at. And again, I'll go back to that Canadian YouTuber that had a failure on his big block. I don't recall exactly what he said. He just said he's followed the manufacturer's recommendations, which I highly doubt. Uh, I believe he said he talked to a, a, a retailer and they gave him the break in uh, instructions. But some camshafts need to be broken in at that 21 to 2300, 2500 at the absolute most. And anything that's got a big heavy valve train in it, uh, big block Chevy comes to mind. Oldsmobile is another one that's got a very heavy valve train in it. You need to reduce the engine RPM. Well, why do you need to run it up at a higher RPM? Is it to get the break-in going? Well, part of that, but the reason being is because the crankshaft throws a lot of the oil that the camshaft sees. And if you're not getting a sufficient amount of oil on the cam, and you generally don't at idle, uh, it's okay, but it's not enough when you're talking about breaking in and, and actually getting materials to kind of wear together. That's the reason why you operate at a higher RPM. It needs to be run so oil gets up onto the camshaft and you get plenty of lubrication up on there. So that's the primary reason behind you know, operating at an RPM to to do a break-in procedure, and they'll tell you to vary the RPMs. I don't know about all that. I'm I'm not. Uh, I, I'm generally a, a you know, if it's a big block Chevy, it's 18, 1900 RPM, and that's it. Um, if it's at 1900 RPM, if it, it fluctuates a little bit naturally because of the way fuel and and everything flows into the engine, and a little bit of a surging that happens. That's that's fr that's fine. There's no problem with that. If it gets up too much, 2,000, 2,100, you better start backing that RPM down because you're going to run into an issue on that heavier valve train stuff. So follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Don't follow what you know some retailer says or what the information is on the on the Amazon website. Whatever it is, call the manufacturer. Ask them specifically for your application what engine RPM they want you to break those in at. Very critical to keeping this thing together. If you've got a windage tray in an engine because you've, you know, it's a race engine and, and you need to break in the cam, but I would remove that windage tray. Remove the windage tray, 
let it work and do the, do what it needs to do to get the oil up onto the camshaft properly when it's done breaking in then you can put your windage tray back in but anything that that restricts how much oil that the camshaft sees is critical so uh, again just little things to think about but if you've got that in that engine um, you got to be careful of how you do the brake in so that generally covers everything I want to talk about about the cam and lifters and the crown taper mismatching break in RPM uh, there's one final thing here and this becomes really the difficult side of it uh, so let's talk about that next I think this is where really where people get a little screwed up on it because it's one it's something that you don't generally think about right away but two it's also very difficult to make these changes so these are both big block springs this is a factory spring this is a new spring uh, but a couple of different designs here i want to talk about when you're talking about spring pressure on braking it needs to be much less and the reason being is you don't want those big seat pressures and open pressures over the nose of the the lifter or the lobe uh, because if you do you're going to affect the zinc and its ability to help facilitate the wear in of that camshaft too much pressure will wipe the zinc push it off there so for that zinc or zddp to do its job it needs to have that protective layer too much spring pressure won't allow for that and this is where we run into the biggest problem here I'm going to go back to that Canadian YouTuber on his big block um, and he showed the picture of the springs that he was using and I don't think he ever mentioned installed height he may not even know what that means but your installed height on the spring also affects how much pressure is on the seat and the open pressure so I'm going to guess that he was probably 150 to 180 on the seat and maybe close to 300 open. You know, 280 to 300 is not uncommon on a big block Chevy. And depending on how aggressive the camshaft, I think he was running a thumper uh, cam. So it had a little bit of pressure on it for sure. But that is an absolute recipe for disaster. Any of these lifters that, that have had... Um, too much spring pressure on it absolutely that is the reason why those lifters failed is when you have too much pressure the zinc can't do its job you're going to destroy it it's just sometimes you'll destroy all of them you know or half of them or just a couple but it's going to take the weakest link out first and once it starts destroying one of these lifters it doesn't matter if the others on the cam survived the other lobes survived you, you didn't use the right spring so those pressures are are a huge part of of what's going on here now if you use like a, a triple spring like this one is here you can certainly remove the damper the and the inner spring and and help reduce that but your machinist should be able to help you if you can't figure it out or you don't uh, know how to do that math to, to figure out what the spring pressures are going to be uh, based on the installed height uh, comp has a really good uh, uh, piece in their uh, catalog that shows you different installed heights on different springs of theirs uh, to show you what the spring pressure will be it's a really really good tool to use to help determine that but whatever you can do to drop that pressure down now there's break-in springs out there that you can purchase that will give you a little less pressure and it's not just for that 30 minute break in time. I would run a break in spring or a spring without all these in here for probably that initial break in period, that three to 400 miles. Why? You need to give the cam time to make sure that it's got where it's needed to be uh, and you're not going to overload it with and, and push all the ZDP out. That's the reason why you uh, run a break in oil too for that uh, extended period of time. So installed height spring pressure huge part of the reason why um, these these camshafts fail i know it's a pain but you know fortunately we can change springs on a cylinder head when it's on the engine so there's really no excuse for not doing it yes is it, is it difficult yes is it another step but if you're trying to get out and use a flat tap at cam because that's what you prefer you're going to have to take the steps necessary to make sure that thing stays alive now one last little thing i want to talk about before i move on to what a really good solution is here for these uh flat tappet cams to survive is 
I saw a video here recently. I forget the YouTuber that, that made it, but he's a fairly decent sized channel uh, that said that they went in and checked the heat treating on the camshaft. That's good if you check the camshaft before the break-in process. If you check the, the cam on any of these lobes that failed to check for heat treat, you are not going to get a good accurate reading of how much uh, heat treat is in there or how much depth is on that heat treat. The reason being is the heat from that break-in process and the failure that occurred with it is going to anneal that that metal and it was does it changes the property of of the camshaft and once it's been had heat put to it and especially that type of heat uh, you can't check heat treat. You can't check a failed camshaft or a run camshaft to, to see what the heat treat depth is. It's just impossible. You can do it before you get started. That's okay. That's possible, but you're not going to do it on a cam that's already run. I don't believe he made mention of that in his video. I just want to make sure that he had that. So if you have the opportunity to, to use a, a Rockwell uh, tester that you can check the hardness of a material uh, has to be before you do the break-in. Now let's talk about the solution. Now, these are a new DLC coated lifter from Comp. Now, I understand everybody's apprehension with Comp and lifters, but here's, the, here's something to think about behind it. Comp is the biggest manufacturer of performance camshafts in the U.S., period, hands down. No one even comes close to the amount that they sell and produce every month. Cam and lifter kits, cams and lifters separately, doesn't matter, K kits. Hands down, they are by far, it's not even close what the other nearest competitor is to it. So when you have that volume of product that goes out into the marketplace, the chances of you having a failure that occur in these uh, is going to be much higher. So when you hear people say, well, yeah, it's comp, they they just use Chinese stuff. They don't. Um, all this stuff is, is poorly quality made. The QC is gone in it. No, the reason why you see more failures here uh, through comp is just because the amount of volume that's in the marketplace. So it's something to consider, but quite honestly, it doesn't hold up to, to the uh, common sense test here. Again, when we talked about these at the beginning, there's Howard's lifters in here, there's Isky, there's Clay Smith, there's all these other brands. There's Illuminati, there's some Crane in there as well when they were still around, uh, and there's a set of comp lifters in here as well. It doesn't matter which one is which. Every flat tappet manufacturer has had a problem. What comp has done is to take a DLC coating and put it on the face or the foot of the lifter here and help control that break-in process that is occurring. DLC is, is, what, we, is what they call diamond-like carbon, and it adds a lot of lubricity to the to the face of that. It allows it to, to not have a lot of wear property. They're very tough. It's a very hard surface and it's very wear resistant. So what you're essentially doing is you're just kind of maybe breaking in the cam a little bit. That DLC coating does not come off of there. Uh, from talking to the folks at Comp at SEMA and PRI this year uh, when this was introduced, uh, They've run these for a lot of cycles on the Spintron. They've abused it with some pretty radical profiles on the camshaft. They've used extreme spring pressures. They've used no break-in oil, no, no break-in assembly lube to try to get these to fail, and they've had pretty good success with it. Uh, good enough success that they didn't have any failures with those lifters or the camshafts during those break-in procedures and a long run cycle on a Sprintron. It's one of the nice things about having that type of equipment is you can run these for a very long period of time at varying RPMs and really beat the snot out of the thing to see how it's going to last. So that's a really good solution here in the marketplace for trying to control the break-in process and try to control what I think is the, the biggest shortcoming or the, the, the biggest weak point within the valve, uh, valve train these days, and I think that's the lifter moreover than the camshaft. It's what certainly takes the brunt of the abuse uh, in a poorly uh, done break-in procedure, and, and if you can fix that one piece, you're pretty good to go. 
So Compass had some DLC coated stuff in the past. They've got a tool steel lifter uh, that I think is a solid lifter um, that they DLC coat more for the race guys. Uh, but this is their first venture into it into the uh, street applications. And I think what this is going to do is it's going to change the market a little bit because now instead of you still need to go through a good break-in procedure. You still need to run a good break-in oil. You got rings and, and a camshaft that still needs to be broken in as well, too. But I think it's going to start to change that process. The failure should drop from, you know, that very small percentage that we're seeing in, across all flat tappet cams anyway to nothing uh, if these DLC-coated lifters are used. Uh, again, everything else is still important. The taper still needs to rotate. Uh, you can't have a non-rotating lifter in there. Uh, you're going to cause some issues. So these DLC coated uh, uh, face lifters are, are going to be a big ga game changer. From what I understand too is, is also too, if you look at lifters, um, some of these are for the same engine, um, but you'll notice that the oil band here is in different locations. And part of that problem is even though that, uh, that lifter may fit a small block Chevy, big block Chevy, and a 348 409, uh, and it's the same bore diameter and uh, height on the, uh, the seat for the push rod, you can still run into some issues where the oil band isn't in the right spot. Uh, and what this has allowed Comp to do is to totally kind of redesign the body to make sure that the, uh, the oil band is going to be in the right spot. So that's kind of a nice thing. I, I don't know much more about these uh, other than I can tell you that a set of the 812-16, which is the small block, big block, uh, at the time that I shot this video, they're 105 bucks, 106 bucks. These this DLC coated lifter is 120. It's not that much more money. So they figured out a way to add that DLC coating to it uh, without making this a 200 or a 250 dollar set of lifters. If it solves the break in problems that we have with it, I'd be happy to pay 200 bucks, 250 bucks for a set of flat tappet lifters. So anyway, I think that's going to be a, a big game changer in the market. I haven't seen any information out, out there, so I wanted to get that out in this video as well because we could talk about failures all day long and what you can do to try to help keep them together, but I also like to keep moving forward here, uh, and I appreciate that about comp. Flat tappet cams are dying out. In 10 years from now, I think you're going to find way fewer of them out there because the cores aren't going to be available. No one's going to want to make the lifters for them. Everything is going roller. I've gone roller. I can't tell you the last time I built a flat tappet motor for myself. It's been close to 20 years ago. Everything has been solid roller or hydraulic roller. Reason being is it's just there's less problems to worry about, less things like this that could happen to it. So. I get it. I understand everybody wanting to play in the, that market because it's a lot cheaper and, and all that. But if you have a failure like this, that occurs once or twice. You, you are already into a, the cost of a billet core and a, and a good, you know, hydraulic roller. So I hope that video cleared up some of the misconceptions that are out there right now. I, I get it. A lot of times it's a guesswork and people go, yeah, I got it figured out. It must be this. And they don't really apply anything to it. Uh, again, I've spent quite a long time on this video, not because uh, I didn't understand everything I needed to know, but I wanted to confirm some of the thing, questions that I had. So I spent a lot of time talking to Lake Speed Jr. I spent a lot of time talking to Billy Godbold over the last 10 months to understand and make sure that the things that I assumed were correct. And I think that's the problem uh, with YouTube in general sometimes is people go, yeah, it must be Chinese. That's the reason why if you look at it, this looks like it's Chinese metal. It's you're guessing. Um, the good news about cam cores is they're all marked fairly easily, and you can tell where that cam core is made if you know how to read those castings that are in there. Uh, so I get it. You know, I mean, we all kind of go through that that phase where we think we know something and then we try to apply it. Um, that's the problem with this is nobody's no knows has known how to apply it. And you can look at failures all day long and, and go, wow, that was really horrible. I wonder what happened. Well, 
if you start, it's like everything else. It's like you go through a checklist of go of say, okay, how did I do this? How did I do the break in? What type of, of cam and lifter did I use? Were they matched? Um, were they by different manufacturers? Did I use the right spring pressure? Did I overpressurize the thing? How, what oil did I use on the break in? Was it a dedicated break in oil? And, and, and did I run it for long enough to, to get the cam properly broken in? There's a lot of little things with this. And, and that's why I think the hydraulic uh, and solid roller stuff has gotten more popular because you just eliminate a big possibility of failure out of it. So I think, you know, comp spending an awful lot of money to try to figure out a way to, to correct this with this DLC coated lifter is a huge deal because it's money that I don't know what they're going to make back up. I mean, again, if these if flat tappet camshafts are dead in 10 years uh, and you sunk an amazing amount of money into doing all the R&D and the, the development and testing and, and making sure that, that DLC coating doesn't flake off there, uh, it's there's a lot of money to be that was spent to try to do that on something that's dying out. So uh, I appreciate the fact that, that someone was willing to, to step forward and go, you know, look, this is a problem. There is something wrong here that we can fix that maybe is outside of what a very complicated break-in procedure looks like and now creates something that makes it much easier. So I got to give Comp two thumbs up for that one for, for, for investing in, again, something that, uh, um, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe that uh, the flat tappet stuff becomes more easy to get a hold of because now those core suppliers are more willing to, to produce those cores and keep the cost down uh, if they produce a ton of them because there's a, a lifter that's now going to survive on there and not chew up the cam. So uh, there's a lot of little things here at play, but uh, I know there's going to be a lot of questions in this one. I know this, this erases a lot of emotional reactions for people because they think they had uh, the right break-in procedure and, and it their cam got screwed up. And I, I hope that we didn't figure out today that you did something wrong, but uh, there's a lot of things at play here. And, and when you get it wrong, um, the, the result is pretty catastrophic. And I hate to see that because it's somebody's hard-earned money. So anyway, if you've got any questions about this one, don't hesitate. Leave them down below. Can't try to keep it civil. I know that, again, everybody gets a little emotional and heated about this, but uh, I wanted to give some more information that I haven't seen in any other video out there. Again, it's taken me 10, 12 months to collect all these different samples from some local machine shops. So I'm really appreciative that they uh, took the time to, to you know, listen to my request and, and hang on to some lifters. And thanks for comp for giving me a sample of these DLC coated lifters at PRI so I could show them in this video. So anyway, if you've got any questions, don't hesitate, leave them down below and uh, yeah, let the argument start.